Digital Foundry is proudly sponsored by the Logitech G935 headset. This was supposed to be AMD's moment, the time when Navi would finally arrive to make Team Red competitive again towards the higher end of the graphics hardware market. But just days before the launch of the Radeon RX 5700 and the RX 5700 XT though, Nvidia fired a new salvo. Three new supercards designed to take the wind out of AMD's sales by offering enhanced performance at a dangerously similar price. In fact, the firm was so confident in its new lineup that it even pulled its embargo forward. The upshot being that the new RTX 2060 Super and RTX 2070 Super will be reviewed ahead of the new 7 nanometer AMD releases, with the 2080 Super to follow in due course. Compared to their vanilla counterparts, the Super Series cards are improved in almost every way. The new GPUs offer a greater number of CUDA cores, higher clocks and improved hardware accelerated ray tracing abilities. However, these higher clock components do draw more power, a little more in the case of the 2060 Super and a fair bit more for the 2070 Super. RTX 2060 S also sports 8 gigs of VRAM compared to the 6 gigs of its predecessor, a good addition bearing in mind that ray tracing in particular can push memory hard. And of course, the more memory you have, the better. So how has Nvidia managed to make these cards super? Well, let's take a look at the RTX 2060 Super first. It's still using the same TU-106 processor as the original, but yes, full memory bandwidth is unlocked, meaning a huge 33% increase in throughput across a 256-bit interface. Extra CUDA cores are also in the mix, giving the 2060S a 13% improvement in compute power. The original 2070 uses the same processor too, and the same memory bandwidth, but still has more CUDA cores. But as we shall see, 2070 and 2060S are virtually interchangeable. But yeah, 2060S is using much more of the TU-106 full potential compared to its predecessor, and it's all retained within the same Founders Edition chassis here. RTX 2070 Super. Well, this one is pretty special and its technical makeup really is intriguing. The original 2070 effectively tapped out everything TU-106 had to offer. All the CUDA cores, all the bandwidth available from its 14 gigabits per second G6. Nvidia's solution for this? Grab a ton of RTX 2080's TU-104 processors that had minor defects on the production line Disable those faulty cores and repackage this chip as the 2070 Super. There's 11% extra in terms of core counts over the 2070, and it has 88% of the 2080's CUDA core count. Again, there's full memory bandwidth, which is great. In a way then, this product is perhaps more 2080 than 2070. And again, if you stack this Super up against the 2080, yeah, you can see that the ports and the chassis and the power inputs basically identical. As we shall discover, the 2070 Super is a bit of a dark horse. Both of these Supers are Founders Editions without a factory overclock, but both routinely stay above 1.9 GHz in operation. Ports-wise, no surprises here. The RTX 2060 Super has an 8-pin power input now instead of the vanilla Model 6 pin, while video outputs consist of twin display ports, USB virtual link, HDMI 2.0 and a legacy dual link DVI. Superfluous, some might say, when it comes to that old interface, but there are a ton of DVI displays out there and I'm happy to see it retained on a mainstream card. Looking at the 2070 Super next, and yeah, we have the 6-pin, 8-pin power input structure imported from the 2080 with the TDP to match, while the port selection, it's identical too. It's a match for the 2060 Super in all but one regard. The Dual Link DVI port gives way to a third display port output, which is fair enough. But you're here for performance, am I right? Unfortunately, what we can't do today is show you how AMD's Navi cards compare. They're still under embargo and we'll get around to those in due course. But first off, let's not forget that RTX supports real-time hardware ray tracing. And I was kind of curious to see how the Super cards compare to their un-Super predecessors. I'm going to kick off here with the purest ray tracing workload I could think of. 
Quake 2 RTX, which delivers the entire experience with full path traced lighting. This benchmark was designed by our resident PC specialist Alex Battaglia and it is indeed a punishing workout. We get a range of interior and exterior shots and the sun's positioning is always on the move. This prevents the game from using temporal information to boost frame rate. Uh, so yeah, this actually uh, halves the frame rate compared to standard gaming. But I'd say that this is more of a true test of ray tracing power and nothing else. So nice stack of results here and the biggest boost is in moving from 2060 to 2060 Super. Across the whole bench, the improvement is in the region of 18%, closely matching the 20% increase in Giga Rays that Nvidia promises. We've got a curious center grouping here of the 2060 Super and 2070, with the older card only 4% faster overall. 2070 Super versus 2070, that'll be a nice 9% boost there. Something I'd like to point out though is that all benches here are from Founders Edition cards. The launch RTX models had a small factory overclock and the Supers don't. So the gap in favor of the new products is actually a touch wider in a purely like for like comparison. Another true ray tracing workout is 3D Mark's Port Royal benchmark. A big, big leap here for the 2060 Super over the vanilla card and just a 7% lead for the 2070 over the 2060S. 2070 Super gets a good 10% upgrade over its predecessor and although you can't see it on the graph here, 2080 is only around 3% faster than the 2070 Super. I think it's fair to say that the biggest performance improvement here goes to the 2060S, but the 2070S is no slouch either. Its output is only a few points shy of the full-on RTX 2080, which isn't bad for a $500 card. So how does this all translate to standard rasterization performance then? Well, Nvidia is promising us that the 2060 Super is faster than the GTX 1080. And this kind of makes sense because it's very much like the old RTX 2070, which in itself was already faster than the 1080. But it's the 2070S I'm kind of more intrigued by because the claim here is that we're looking at GTX 1080 Ti levels of performance. And in turn, if that claim holds true, it's not AMD's RX 5700 XT that the 2070 Super will be challenging. It'll be the $700 Radeon 7. First of all, before we get into the juicy stuff, I wanna show you how my first run of performance renders went. If you look at my Eurogamer review, we have all the data for a big bunch of cards at 1080p, 1440p and 4K resolution. But my focus here in the video is on 1440p. The obvious comparison points are going to be to stack up the super cards against their non-super counterparts. Thing is though, the results are, I'd say they're just a bit dull. <laughs> Let's go through some numbers in turn. Assassin's Creed Odyssey 2060S beats out its predecessor by around 11% and it's only 4% worse off than a 2070. Meanwhile, the 2070S delivers only half of that frame rate improvement about 5% faster than the 2070. Now, returns may well be diminished here in terms of an overall average, because even though I've got an 8700K running at 4.7 gigahertz across all cores, this game can still hit CPU limits at 1440p. But the pattern is definitely established. 2060 lurks at the very bottom there, then its super counterpart is higher up. With the 2070, those two kind of lurk in the middle. And the 2070S, that's at the top of the pile. The older Assassin's Creed Unity isn't quite so CPU bound, so we get a more common result. 2060S delivers a 14 point lead against its predecessor. 2070S, 13%. Again, we have that grouping in the middle there of 2060S and 2070. They're very, very similar. Give or take a point or two, and the same pattern emerges across most of the other benchmarks too. Here's Far Cry 5, where the differentials are again much the same. And this all kind of makes sense, right? After all, these cards are all of the same architecture. Three of them are even using the same TU-106 processor. So yeah, here's the same pattern once again, in Ghost Recon Wildlands, and the same thing in Crisis 3. But sometimes things are switched up just a little. Shadow of the Tomb Raider does see a variation in the grouping, for example. 2060S gets a big upgrade over the 2060. 
about 18%. 2070 is about 5% to the better though, while the 2070S is increased over that is only about 10%. Seems to me that Q to core count might be more important than the frequency in this one. Now I actually saw something very similar in The Witcher 3 as well. After a big bump from 2060 to 2060S, there's more of a gradual stepping there, 2070, 2070S and whatnot. But let's return to Nvidia's 1080 and 1080 Ti level performance claims because the story there is just a little bit more interesting. We'll start with the 2060 Super because you do get a pretty impressive bump to performance here, offset a little by the fact that it is a $400 card. So yes, uh, 2060S obviously more powerful than the 2060, but it's had a price rise as well. Regardless, with Assassin's Creed Odyssey, 2060S delivers a 10 point lead over GTX 1080. This game has never been friendly to AMD hardware, so the increase is a whopping 27% if you're stacking it up against the Vega 64 there. Battlefield 1, it's a game that's very much the opposite though, very friendly indeed to AMD hardware and Vega specifically. 2060S is still faster though, to the tune of 12% across the bench here, a score that rises to 13.5% against GTX 1080. Look, I'd say the GTX 1080 is still a really good card, so overall, this is pretty good going. Far Cry 5 also produces pleasing results for the 2060S, if not quite as dominant as it is elsewhere. About 4-6% to 6 to the better of the old Nvidia GTX 1080 and the Vega 64 here. To put things into perspective with another mainstream GPU though, the 2060S is actually 31% faster than GTX 1070 on this one, and only 2% slower than an RTX 2070. So yeah, a bit more background there. I think you get the picture though. I could only find a couple of examples of the GTX 1080 offering any kind of resistance. Crisis 3 across the whole bench is ever so slightly faster, but with a 1.1% advantage, it's margin of error stuff. Interestingly, once an average is taken across all three sections of the Rise of the Tomb Raider benchmark, GTX 1080 also inches ahead, though the situation reverses radically in the latest Shadow of the Tomb Raider. All things being equal then, Nvidia makes bold claims for the RTX 2060 Super and they pretty much all hold up, but the GTX 1080 Ti performance claims for the 2070 Super are going to be especially interesting for a couple of reasons. First of all, if verified, this makes it a strong contender not just for 1440p, but also for 4K gaming. And secondly, we're kind of looking to expensive offerings, more expensive cards like Radeon 7 and RTX 2080 to get that level of performance combined with all the RTX features. $500 for that seems eminently reasonable. But what's the reality? Well, it's close, really close, close enough that while it doesn't quite match the GTX 1080 Ti, I'd say it's more than close enough considering the overall package. Rewind to Assassin's Creed Odyssey once more and in our stack of Radeon 7, 1080 Ti and RCX 2080. It's third out of four contenders. 1080 Ti 4% faster, 2080 7 points to the better. However, 2070S has a 6% lead over Radeon 7 here, and for those wondering, Radeon 7 is still a touch slower at full 4K. You'll see I'm sticking with my 1440p benching for this video review though. Far Cry 5, again at 1440p, we're talking Radeon 7 performance, though the AMD card does pull ahead at 4K. And yeah, I have the GTX 1080 Ti being 3% faster here, with the 2080 being 7% faster. But one thing I want to stress once again, the 2080 is a Founders Edition card with a small factory overclock. It's kind of insignificant in terms of actual gameplay, but in terms of benchmarking, it will add a few points to performance differentials. Ghost Recon Wildlands next, and another double-edged sword for the 2070S up against Radeon 7. It commands a slight two-point lead at 1440p, but it would be remiss of me not to point out that the AMD cards got a 3% advantage at 4K. GTX 1080 Ti, 4% better, 2080, 6.5% with the caveats I've previously mentioned. I think the takeaway here really is that we're seeing a distinct power band defined here. Yes, there's consistency in the placing of the cards, 
but in a world of factory overclocks, manual overclocks and whatnot, there's something of a gray area here. GTX 1080 Ti, I'd say, is still the faster card than 2070 S, but it's only lagging behind by around 3%. Given the choice, it's a toss-up really between the extra memory the 1080 Ti provides versus the world of RTX the super delivers. Real-time ray tracing, DLSS, variable rate shading, the whole shooting match. 1080 Ti has got none of those. Of course, once again, Crisis 3 can deliver an outlier. GTX 1080 Ti, almost 10% faster at 1440p, and I suspect that back in the day there might have been some major low-level driver optimization done on that one. Whereas it probably doesn't require that kind of attention these days. And yes, while I've been comparing the 2070 S to the higher tier cards, and yeah, I've often found it to be very competitive to Radeon 7, Got to point out here that Battlefield 1 sees the AMD Monster deliver a 10-point improvement over the 2070S at 1440p, rising to a huge 14 points at 4K. It's actually 6 to 8% to the better, stacked up to the full-blooded 2080. So yeah, the Radeon 7, it could still pull out some fierce performance. So let's wrap this all up then. RTX 2060 Super, $400 and almost entirely across the board, it's faster than GTX 1080 and faster still than Vega 64. It's got the complete RTX feature set, it's got 8 gigs of uncompromised G6 over a decent interface and it's a really nice piece of kit. By and large, its performance is so close to the outgoing RTX 2070 that you might as well consider it a $100 price cut to that older model. Quite a lot of our benches see the older card inch ahead, but remember that once again, it's factory overclocked out of the box and the Super isn't. Super though, is generally about 13% faster than RTX 2060 and the battle against the upcoming Navi-based RX 5700 should be fascinating. RTX 2070 Super then. Its performance is similarly robust but not quite as pronounced as the 2060 Supers. It doesn't quite match the RTX 2080 but on the other hand it's not exactly a million miles away either. And likewise with comparisons against GTX 1080 Ti. But the point is that even at reference specs up against the 2080's factory OC, it is there or thereabouts and obviously it's a lot cheaper than the RTX 2080 which is going to make the upcoming 2080 Super an interesting proposition. Still, 2070S, genuinely viable 4K card in my opinion, brilliant at 1440p, and yes, once again, obviously, it has all of the RTX feature set. It's a good deal. I think in many ways then, Super is what many may have wanted from RTX last year. Extra performance at lower price points compared to prior generation cards. And in turn, Super is more of a refresh than a major new launch. Is it enough to give Nvidia leadership over the Navi cards? We'll be testing Navi and bringing you our results on July 7th. But that's all for me for now. As always, like, subscribe and share if you enjoyed the work. Ring the bell for instant notifications whenever a new DF video is published. And yes, to our Patreon supporters, we love you all. Your direct support for the team makes a huge difference in being able to bring you the content we want to produce on our own terms. So if you like what we do and you aren't on board, please do consider that. Anyway, that's where I'm going to leave things for now. Thanks for watching and be sure to check back for the Navi Showdown. Featuring 2.4 GHz wireless, 50mm Pro-G audio drivers, and DTS Headphone X 2.0 surround sound technology under the hood, the G935 headset delivers the ultimate wireless audio solution for gamers, whether you're playing on PC, PlayStation 4, Xbox One, Nintendo Switch, or mobile. Order yours today from Logitech G.